welcome everyone uh, to this online presentation today. Uh, the focus of this talk is online voter education, how election management bodies engage with voters on social media. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. My name is Alison Harrell and I'm the co-director for the Consortium on Electoral Democracy and also a professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal. Um, and this event is a co-sponsorship co-sponsorship between the Electoral Integrity Project and, and CDEM. So it's a real pleasure to be here. This is our first co-sponsored activity. So I'm really pleased. Um, my job today will be to moderate this discussion. And so I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers first and then I'll turn it over to, to Leah and Mara to, to start the presentation. So we have three distinguished speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is Leah Maravaki, who is an assistant professor in American politics at Mississippi State University. Um, and her research agenda is really situated within the growing field of election sciences, including the study of election reforms, administration, voter education, as well as issues around election data transparency and accessibility. Uh, Nick Gamash is the Acting Director of Media Relations and Environmental Monitoring at Elections Canada, um, which is the independent agency that oversees federal elections here in Canada. Uh, he's also responsible for Election Canada's social media accounts. And then finally, we have Mara Setman Lee, who's an assistant professor of American politics at Connecticut College. Uh, she ho uh, they host the podcast, What Voting Means to Me, uh, and she has published in the American Politics Research, Election Law Journal, and Political Research Quarterly, among other outlets, um, looking at how local election officials communicate with constituents about elections and voting through social media platforms. The format for today's talk is that Leah and Mara will uh, present in the first 25 minutes or so uh, from their research and then we'll get the practitioner's perspective from Nick afterwards for 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll open it up for discussion with the audience. Um, when we get to that portion, you can either raise your hand using the little raise hand function of Zoom. Uh, it's on your bottom bar and you should be able to select that in the reactions. Uh, tab. You can also put your questions in the chat either during the presentation or afterwards and I can um, read those on your behalf. So we'll jump right in uh, with Leah and Mara. I'm not sure which of you would like to start. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, thank you, Holly. Um, it's great to be here. We're excited to um, to talk about our work on voter education and also, also engage with uh, with Nick uh, on what is going on in Canada. Uh, thank you for bringing us together. I will get things started. Um, the first step is sharing my screen and hope that it all uh, works and we can get started. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, some of our current work with Mara um, on voter education in the United States, specifically online. Um, we will walk you through uh, a lot of the projects that we are working for the last three years on uh, measuring voter education and how we shifted uh, and focused on local election officials use of social media and what are our, our, our current findings and some of the major questions that we have as we're moving our projects forward. Um, this is uh, one example of uh, the things that we started looking at uh, with Mara uh, when we um, focused on social media among local election officials. Uh, this is Lake County Supervisors of Elections uh, official Facebook page in Florida. The post was October 2, 2020, so a month before uh, the November election. This is just uh, one of the many examples of what things election officials talk about on their social media accounts, particularly Facebook. And uh, this post is specifically about uh, debunking some misinformation about how mail voting works and an effort from election officials to reassure voters that the mail process is secure, but also how it works. Uh, given some uh, efforts to discredit the process and how secure it is. So this gives us an idea um, of what are some of the uh, issues that local election officials deal with when it comes to informing voters um, and some of some emerging issues that we haven't uh, really thought about before and we're exploring those in our work. So we started this project uh, thinking about voter education, how important it is um, for elections, but 
uh, lacking a broader understanding of what voter education entails. So we all think we know what it means, but uh, putting it into um, a, concrete, a concrete definition is very challenging. So through our research, we identified some elements, uh, both uh, through how the Help America Vote Act has identified voter education and has guided the states to create their voter education programs, but also how states uh, actually do voter education. So there are two to three elements um, surrounding the definition, the broader definition of voter education. One is the very basic uh, how to vote. Local election officials specifically who are tasks uh, who are tasked with managing elections at the local level, um, they are also tasked with voter education and their job is to inform voters about the process of voting. Uh, when to register to vote, what are the voter registration deadlines, how to register to vote, what is the, the available methods of registration in your state, is it online, is it automatic, is it paper-based, what are some of the things that voters need to know when they prepare to register to vote as new voters, but also as existing voters to update their information. Um, election officials also inform voters about how, how to actually vote after they register to vote. Um, can you vote by mail? Can you vote in person? Can you vote early? Can you use a drop box? Uh, when should you return your mail vote? Uh, what happens if uh, it's lost in the mail? How do you request another one? How do you use our online platforms to request your absentee or your mail vote? Um, so a lot of information about navigating the election process itself. Uh, major deadlines. Uh, what do I do when I come in person? What is the required identification? if any, in my state? What are my rights as a voter? Um, and this is particularly important given concerns about voter intimidation, is it okay for someone to approach me to give me a bottle of water uh, or am I breaking any law? What do I do if uh, um, a poll watcher is questioning my eligibility? What are my rights? So these are important items, uh, elements in the process of voting that election officials uh, inform voters about. The second dimension, uh, and we have seen a lot of um, confusion and frustration um, and concerns about transparency and security about the process of election administration itself. That has to do with processes uh, that involve how voter records are maintained, whether they're clean and whether there are uh, um, irregular or illegal removals of voters. Um, and whether uh, having inflated voter rolls is a good or a bad thing, what does it mean? Um, having pre-election voting technology checks, otherwise called logic and accuracy tests, and when those are done, and whether they're transparent, and how, um, how this is communicated to the voters as part of the election process uh, that election officials are involved with counting and certification of their votes. We know there, many, there were many concerns in 2020 about whether counting was secure, whether casting of illegal ballots and whether they would be counted. So these processes are also part of the efforts um, um, that election officials inform voters. And of course, last but not least, uh, and those lists of course are not, ex are, are not um, exhaustive um, audits. So how do we verify election outcomes? How do we know that uh, there's no tampering with votes and uh, our, uh, our totals are accurate and secure and reliable? And another element that we have started to observe since 2016 is misinformation, the spread of misinformation and disinformation and how local election officials are stepping in to uh, correct the record, um, either pre proactively um, or after the fact, uh, and as a trusted source of information um, to ensure voters that, you know, this is how the process works and don't listen to anything else. Um, listen to me when I tell you that this is how you should request your mail ballot. This is when you should vote. Um, so these are some of the items uh, involved in the broader category of voter education. Now, we argue that uh, studying uh, voter education, particularly in, online, uh, in the online sphere, is important uh, because we know from research that voters, uh, we know that they use social media, uh, we're glued on our, to our phone, um, regardless of age, uh, through different platforms, we communicate, and that's what we use to seek information. We know that many voters, past research has shown that voters seek information online, they go to state websites, they go to a local election websites, but they also are informed through their networks uh, in online um, platforms, social media platforms. Um, that can be a great um, shortcut, but it can also um, create uh, disadvantages uh, and opportunities for bad faith actors to misinform voters. Um, and we know that that has been spreading uh, very uh, fast um, and it penetrates to my platforms and it has the capacity to really infiltrate uh, our bubbles and um, maintain um, false narratives about how secure the process is or how to uh, participate in the elections. 
we also know from research, a lot of surveys on local election officials, that they are invested, they are committed to their work, and they care about informing, they have a responsibility to their constituents to inform them about the election process, and that what they do on their part uh, um, is not biased, they are, uh, they are uh, defenders of democracy themselves and election heroes, but many times they don't have the resources and the capacity to effectively conduct voter education, not only online, but also through different platforms and different media mediums. So we know that there are constraints on local election officials on how able they are to and effectively and of course these constraints sometimes are uh, driven by state legislative action as we see um, in some of the efforts in 2021 among states to make it harder for election officials to actually conduct voter education. The gap that we're trying to fill through our work is uh, the use of social media, A, because it's very accessible and it's broadly used by both voters and individuals and local election officials are voters themselves. They have their own networks and they can use them uh, for their purpose uh, through their office. Um, and this is largely unexplored. We have no idea how uh, social media, uh, how powerful a tool it can be. We know that it can be in theory, but we have no idea how it is used across the states and within jurisdictions, how effectively uh, and how election officials basically interact with voters through social media. And we argue that this is a good way to systematically assess uh, these voter education efforts on this particular platform um, across and within the state. So we can have a standardized um, way to measure voter education efforts online and evaluate variation across and within the states. Uh, so how we walk, went to measure voter education, particularly online, we look at different platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we check for the presence of um, local election officials for over 6,000 local election jurisdictions in the United States. There are many, many local election jurisdictions. So we pulled a lot of this data um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift it over to Mara in a bit so she can talk about her work on this uh, because through funding, we were able to do this um, and she has successfully um, secured that. So we're looking at these different, pl different platforms and the first thing we look at is whether um, a local election official has an official website uh, and if not, um, so we document that variation, presence or absence, and then we start looking into how election officials use those platforms and how long they have been using those platforms to communicate with voters. Um, and that required a lot of um, digging into this post, uh, thousands and thousands of posts over time um, and multiple during the day. So we did a lot of content analysis of select states to start looking at the different um, issues and we, st we started to create our code book so that we can apply it more broadly um, uh, and more, with more sophisticated uh, approaches across all the states and over time. So what I will do now, oh, I have a few top line findings and then I'm gonna uh, shift it off, off tomorrow. So, so far the major um, items that we have identified is that Facebook is by far the most popular uh, tool for election officials. So it's broadly used across the states and jurisdictions. Uh, that said, uh, there is tremendous variation across and within the states in whether it is used and how it is used and very inconsistent. Um, but we do uh, find, um, confirming our expectations, that election officials post a lot about how to vote. This is when the deadline is to request your mail ballot. This is when we start with, uh, sending our mail ballots to voters. Remember, today's the voter registration deadline. Remember, today's national voter registration day. But we identify that election officials post less about election the election administration process so uh, fewer posts about we're conducting you know voter technology checks we're uh, conducting the certification today so we, we see so the comparative to those two items uh, there are way more posts about the process of voting um, so the top line findings again through our research is that we identify that there is a relationship between the usage of social media and outcomes uh, on behavior, and we call those educative effects. So we 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 theorize that the social media usage among local election officials has the power to empower, to inform voters and educate them about the process so that they don't make mistakes. Uh, it is very difficult to determine whether. Um, a voter sees the, the post of an election official and actually does a, an action. But we do find that there are a lot of behaviors associated with uses of social media, and that is uh, using online voter registration, 
uh, and how to use mail voting and reducing the rates of uh, rejected mail ballots. And also we theorize that the bigger picture is we theorize that um, as a result of those educative uh, efforts, voters will have more confidence in the election process and in the accuracy of um, the election. So before I, uh, that was a quick spoiler, before I move on to the actual visuals, I'm gonna pass it on to Mara so that she can talk a little bit more about how she was able to secure funds for this project. Thank you, Leah. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I Leah did a great job of describing um, what the data sort of uh, collection process involved. It was a really, really immense effort um, and it's ongoing because the social media environment of local election officials is changing. Um, so let me describe what we are looking at here. Um, so these, this is sort of the, uh, a heat map of all of the, the online presence. So this is local election officials with a website, with a Facebook page or face, and or Facebook page, Twitter account, Instagram account um, across the United States. Uh, so this is for county level jurisdictions. You notice that Alaska, Wisconsin, and all of these New England states aren't shaded. That doesn't mean voters there don't have any information online from their local election officials. Um, these are places where the local election jurisdiction is at the township level. So right now we're really focusing in on the county level. Um, and so the darker shaded uh, counties are counties where a local election official has a website, an active Facebook page, an active Twitter account, um, and an active Instagram account. And so the darker shades of the counties where there are more coverage, um, sort of their overall online presence, at least as we're measuring it right now. I think we'll get to TikTok and Snapchat at some point, but data collection there, uh, I think it's going to be an interesting challenge. Uh, so Leah, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so I'll move through these pretty quickly, but I did want to break down based on the social media platform just so people could see what the variation looks like and, um, you know, really sort of highlight how Facebook is, is the most popular. So we see here again, the counties that are shaded in blue are the counties that had an active Facebook account during the 2020 uh, presidential election during the three months leading up to the election and the months following the election um, before uh, inauguration day in January. Uh, and then the next slide should show the Twitter presence, um, which gets much smaller. And then following that, the next slide shows the Instagram presence. Um, so there's a lot of action happening over there in California. And beyond that, we see that there's some clustering in uh, states um, like Florida and Ohio, which sort of intuitively makes sense if you think about those as places that see a lot of action during election cycles. Um, so you can go on to the next slide, Leah. Thank you. Um, so, so just to give uh, folks a sense of what this looks like broken down um, in terms of descriptive numbers, 89% um, of all local election offices have some kind of a website or a web page. This does not speak to the quality of the information on those pages, it just means that there is a site that voters can search um, and sort of at the very least find, you know, their LEO's contact information. 35% um, of counties have a Facebook page, only 8% have a Twitter page, and 2% have an Instagram page. And if you could go to the next slide, Leah, I'll just talk a little bit about sort of different indicators that um, we're finding that seem to explain these, vari uh, these variations. So not surprisingly, jurisdictions that are larger, that have more registered voters, probably have more resources, are more likely to have a robust online presence. Um, we've also found that those with more colleges and universities are more likely to have an active LEO online. And sort of we're still parsing out what those causal mechanisms uh, might be there. It's likely that there's sort of this visible constituency in need of information about elections. You have this whole host of new voters um, every school year in these counties. Um, there also does seem to be some sort of relationship with electoral competition. Um, local election officials in states that are regularly competitive in presidential elections, particular like Ohio and Florida, um, seem to have a more robust online presence. Um, and this is, you know, I, possibly due to the fact that there's this sort of increased scrutiny uh, on these states and this sort of increased need for transparency. Um, there does not seem to be much of a relationship with partisanship, at least in terms of the partisan makeup of jurisdictions. Um, folks who study local election officials know it's quite hard to track down the partisan identity of local election officials, especially those that are um, nonpartisan or they're appointed. So we're still working on figuring that out. And then there's this really idiosyncratic question. Um, Leah actually brought this up a couple of months ago. Like maybe 
maybe what explains the variation is that just some LEOs really like Facebook. Like there could be these, these, these completely personal factors that sort of belie our standard understandings of bureaucratic behavior that explain this variation. Let me go to the next slide, Leah. So I wanted to give a little bit of an insight into what LEOs are posting about and how we actually went about coding voter education. So the code book we've developed is like 20 pages, it's long, it's a big code book. Um, and so uh, this is an example of how we've broken down the coding based on different topics. So these are three topics related to information about how to vote, voter registration, vote by mail and early in-person voting. Um, and so within each of these topics, we've broken it down based on information voters would need to have in order to successfully complete these items. So for voter registration, you need to know the deadline. You need to know uh, how to update your information. Um, maybe there's, you know, an option to register online to vote by mail. You got to know how to request it. Maybe there's an option to request it online. You got to know a deadline to return it, how to return it, um, what to do with the return envelope. There's all these different processes that voters, um, you know, both need to be aware of in terms in order to be able to cast a ballot, but also processes that will help make their experience easier. Like, oh, wow, I can just click this link and register online or request my mail ballot. Um, and so this is the type of fine green detail that we're going into with our coding. Uh, so Leah, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to give an example of what this looks like. So the state that we have spent the most time hanging out in, um, in our, our content analysis is Florida. It seems like an obvious choice, I suppose, for folks who are familiar with US elections. It's one of those regularly contested elections in presidential election years. Um, and so what we see here is evidence of what Leah was describing before, um, which is that local election officials um, post a lot about how to vote. So lots of posts about mail voting during 2020, lots of poster registration, early in-person voting. We see that posts explicitly about misinformation are sort of way down at the bottom. Um, we, we saw during the, the full year, January 1st, 2020 to January 20th, 2021, about 153 misinformation posts, um, but something we're exploring sort of how to capture posts that might be implicitly responding to misinformation. Um, so, oh man, I saw this item in the news about fake drop boxes. Guess I better post a couple of things about where to find a drop box. And so those are posts that don't necessarily directly call out misinformation, but it's sort of an interesting uh, measurement challenge that we're navigating. Um, but we can, and this is sort of not even, there's a whole other category. There's a, this is not even an exhaustive list of all of the different things that we've developed for our code book. All right, let's see, next slide. So now for just a couple of slides, I'm gonna turn it back over to Leah, um, who is gonna talk about what we are doing to try to parse out the effects of all of these data that we've collected on voter behavior. Sort of like, does this, do these efforts actually matter? I think that that sort of, is probably the question that most folks are interested in. We argue that from a normative perspective, it's important for local election officials to be active in educating voters and have an online presence. But of course we wanna know if this matters. So um, Leah is gonna talk a little bit about online voter registration and vote by mail. And then I'm gonna sort of dip my toes into some of the work that we're starting to do to look at voter confidence. Thank you, Mara. Um, so we, we're trying to be very careful when we theorize about how um, the use of social media from election officials actually affect outcomes. And it's very hard to theorize about their impact on, on uh, voter turnout. Um, so we're trying to be more careful about um, those claims that we make um, in terms of behavior. Um, and the 2020 election was a great opportunity to study um, online voter registration uh, because in-person registration was very limited. Um, and so we theorize that there is, there is a great opportunity for election officials to direct uh, their voters to use the uh, OVR system in Florida, uh, A, to register as new voters, but also to update their voter registration information. So their name, their partisanship, or their address. Um, so that when they go on election day, they don't have to um, have any issues and they can cast a valid ballot. So uh, the plot on the left shows the relationship between um, using the OVR structure. Um, so logging into the online voter registration platform in September, so a month before the November election, and um, the relationship between that and uh, new registration. So we found that um, when voters in Florida use the online voter registration, they do use it to uh, register to vote as new voters. Interestingly, we found, we found no relationship between 
uh, Facebook posting among election officials and new registrations, which suggests that um, there might be challenges in, in local election officials reaching new voters. But on the right hand side, we show that there's a strong and positive relationship between Facebook posting among election officials, particularly in the last month uh, before the election in 2020, and using the OVR platform. Uh, so those two basically tell us a story that election officials might have a hard time reaching your voters, but they might be very effective when they use uh, a social media platforms, particularly Facebook, to inform voters about um, direct voters to the online voter registration platform so that they can update their voter registration. So they might be more effective in reaching existing voters and ensuring that they have everything they need. So when they go to request a mail ballot or when they go to vote in person, they don't have any issues with the voter registration record, but they might have trouble with reaching new voters, either because um, non-voters may not be following them on Facebook um, or uh, because there are other actors like campaigns and uh, third-party registration groups or other ways that um, non-voters actually become registered voters uh, outside from the, the scope of what election officials are doing um, on social media. And we argue that this is a very important finding because we can understand um, some of the challenges election officials might have when it comes to actually identifying um, those um, eligible but unregistered voters, particularly online. Um, we also find evidence of uh, educative effects uh, between uh, when it comes to studying which items election officials talk about and behavior, particularly with mail voting in 2020 in Florida. So we identified that those uh, jurisdictions that were posting about how to use vote by mail and the deadlines requested and how to check whether your uh, mail has, uh, has counted and is counted and the usage of mail voting in a county, we observed a positive and statistically significant relationship. We, we saw this plot to demonstrate the variation across the counties there were some counties in our in our um, data set uh, that were very active um, in posting on Facebook, and um, and the, the data suggests that the more active you are in talking about vote by mail, the more vote by mail is used in your county, but also that there's so much variation in how much election officials are um, posting on Facebook about this process, which. Um, undeniably was the most uh, uh, utilized voting method in 2020. So we find it that to be a very significant finding, A, because it highlights um, maybe constraints uh, from election officials or uh, how they prefer to get the word out, but B, but C, when they do, we observe a positive outcome uh, when it comes to voter behavior. Um, so yeah, so I can pass it uh, to Mara now and we'll yeah. give this to yeah, and I and uh, I I don't want to make sure that we don't run over time here. Um, so um, what Leah just covered was um work that is very much um under review in progress. Will hopefully be out um sometime within the next year. I don't know if that's that's too ambitious. Um, but I think that the big question, um, sort of the the question that is underlying a lot of our work is this question about the relationship between online voter education and voter confidence. Um, it's an especially pertinent question here in the United States, um, given everything that's happened over the last, uh, what, how long has it been? Four years, it feels like, feels like longer, it feels like a lifetime. Um, so we're, we're beginning to um, explore this question of sort of, you know, whether or not LEOs that have this active online presence are going to also have voters that are more confident in their vote count. Um, and some of the very, very preliminary work that I've been exploring using our data and data from the survey of the performance of American elections that's done by the folks over at MIT, um, there does seem to be a positive relationship between um, LEO use of social media and individual beliefs. Um, so at the individual level that votes were counted accurately. So your vote, county votes, and especially confidence that um, state votes, votes across your state and votes across the country were counted accurately. Um, and so this is something that we want to be very, very careful about making causal claims uh, about at this point, um, but it's sort of the, the direction that our research is headed. Um, and of course, we're going to be digging into uh, the impact of content shared, um, sort of looking specifically like we did with mail voting um, about the impact of information about the elections process, active efforts to debunk mis and disinformation. And I think sort of the, the point that I want to make before we um, move on to our concluding slide is that I think we're really thinking about how to use these data of LEO online presence um, as this sort of 
po a possible proxy for how visible their efforts are in their communities more broadly. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with the US system of elections, uh, it's really decentralized here. Uh, and so it's really hard to get sort of accurate cross jurisdiction measures of LEO presence. So um, I think it's, it's of course an important question. Does a voter see a post by an LEO and then you know, oh my gosh, I do feel more confident about ballot counting. I just saw this whole process laid out, but also there's something to be said about like thinking about or thinking about the, um, just their sort of overall presence in their communities and sort of how active they are in um, communicating about the election process. So um, Leah, if you wanna go, oh, you already are on the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, the, the, the confidence piece is a big part of the next steps um, that we're gonna be looking at. Um, we're really interested in, um, you know, understanding, you know, strategies behind posting, um, what's best to post, when is best to post it, how often, um, you know, are videos more effective, um, you know, we're able to look at things like uh, interactions, shares, likes, comments, etc, to get a sense of that. Um, obviously digging into this piece about how LEOs handle uh, misinformation within their networks and the effects of that. And then again, this big question of, is it, is it possible to determine a causal relationship? Um, you know, how uh, do posting post value impact behavior beyond sort of your standard social media interactions? Yeah, like what is the, the what is the relation? Is it a direct impact? Is it indirect? Um, and then I think that's um, this bigger question of sort of what other activities capture online voter education. So there's the social media proxy, but also sort of, you know, websites, we haven't even begun to dig into websites and the contents that shared on websites. Um, and I think that bigger picture, um, you know, we are really interested in understanding how we can use these data sort of to form a foundational understanding of what voter education looks like in the United States. Um, and sort of the the, the next sort of big hurdle, I think, will be to tackle jurisdictions where all efforts are offline. Um, and it's it's much more difficult to sort of get a sense of what's going on. So that is my concluding thoughts, Leah. I don't know if you want to add anything else. Yeah, uh, if we are okay with time, I have a few, um, just a few more comments. Um, on the last part, particularly, uh, we do focus on social media because it's accessible. We have all this major, uh, you know, this data that we can look at and explore. Um, and there is research already out there, particularly um, uh, Holly, um, uh, her paper on uh, websites has been very important because it gives us a, a nice baseline to evaluate um, do states have an, a state election website? Um, and building off that work, uh, we're looking at um, whether the, the, the existence of a county election website exists and, and how, how is it structured, what kind of information is posted there. So the, the quality is important as well because um, it's, it might not be sufficient to evaluate whether uh, there is a, a, a website or not. So what kind of things election officials post? And of course, the bigger question uh, that we are interested in, as Mara said, is does it make a difference? And uh, yeah, if, if an, an election official is just... Um, likes to to post on Facebook, um, well, if there has to be an effectiveness behind the action. So we can learn also about uh, what is the best way to use this tool uh, to effectively communicate and improve uh, the voter experience and, and uh, not even considering the challenges between uh, among voters who cannot access because they don't have internet. That's why we're, we're, you know, we're placing this in the broader question about equitable access to voter education uh, and uh, looking at online is just one way to do this, uh, but it is very important since many Americans use um, social media um, and they get their information and misinformation from social media. So that's it from us. Great. Thank you so much, Leah and Mara. That was really fascinating. It sounds like you have a wealth of data uh, to, that you can continue to dig into. We're going to turn over the presentation now to Nick, who's going to give us more of a uh, practitioner's perspective on this. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about uh, the experiences at Elections Canada. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks to uh, our first two speakers. That was really, really interesting. And I'm looking forward to having a bit more time to dig into that uh, data myself. Uh, so I will now share my screen. I've got a quick presentation. Uh, and uh, then I'll be happy to, uh, to take some questions. Um, so the first thing that uh, we're going to do is, uh, is just uh, go over what really is Elections Canada. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we communicate, uh, generally speaking, and how uh, 
we ultimately use social media as part of our overall communications effort. Uh, so Elections Canada, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We're an independent non- interrupt you for a second, Nick? Yes. Are, are you trying to share your screen? Because we can't see it yet, I don't oh, think. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I was trying. Uh, um, oh, there you go. Uh, uh, so I will. Can you see that now? We see your slides and notes. And notes. Yep, we're not seeing the shared presentation. We're seeing. Can Can you um hit the little mm. bar at the bottom to sh to start the presentation? Hold on, hold on. Of course, that was going to happen. <laughs> Uh, mm, let me go. I'm gonna try something. I've got too many screens. This is a leftover from the election. <laughs> okay. While Nick is organizing his screens to share them, I'll just remind the audience that after Nick's presentation, we'll be taking comments and questions from the audience. And there's two ways that you can do that. One is by posting them in the chat and I'll read them out loud for you. And um, the other way is to use the reaction um, option at the bottom and, and raise your hand and then I'll call on you and you can pose your question by your, uh, out loud. Okay. Okay. How is this? Perfect. We can see it. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So I won't go over my wonderful first slide again. Uh, just get to who we are. So we're an independent agency. Our role is to administer uh, only federal elections. We have nothing to do with provincial or municipal elections in Canada. And a Federal election in this country is really 338 uh, elections in each electoral district, but all with the same rules, all governed by the uh, Canada Elections Act. We had uh, an election not too long ago. I'm still recovering a little bit. Uh, it was uh, on September 20th, and uh, just uh, just uh, north of 17 million people voted, uh, which uh, is roughly a 62.5% uh, turnout rate, which is a bit down from uh, our previous election in 2019. Uh, how we communicate. Um, so we have a, an overall approach uh, that is good for the entire country, the entire agency that we call the voter information campaign uh, that includes uh, television, radio, uh, out of home, so billboards that you would see uh, and digital components. And this is what we do for election campaigns. We have this voter information campaign with overall very high level messaging that we divide into various phases uh, focused on uh, where, when, and ways to register and vote. So at the beginning of an election, we'll focus on registration, uh, then the delivery of the voter information card, which is a card that every uh, Canadian elector gets in the mail with all the information they need to register and vote. And then we talk about early voting options uh, and election day reminders. For this election, we added a component, which was the uh, health and safety measures because uh, it was an election delivered in the context of a pandemic. And we added uh, a very small but new component that I uh, care deeply about, which is a safeguards component to talk about the various safeguards that we use uh, to protect our electoral system and the integrity of our, uh, our electoral system. Uh, so we get to uh, the important part for today, which is how do we use uh, social media at Elections Canada? So we've got accounts on five platforms, both uh, French and English, of course. Uh, we're talking about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, which are the, the main ones that we use to communicate. We also have a YouTube channel uh, that is, is growing and doing better. And LinkedIn, uh, we do use uh, because there's a big recruitment component to what we do. Uh, and that's the main goal for that platform. And we uh, use social media both to post proactive 
content, uh, but also to respond to inquiries. And I'll talk a bit more about that later because that's an increasingly important component of what we do. Uh, so how do we use uh, various uh, platforms? So you see here an example of, a, of an Instagram uh, uh, carousel that we did. Uh, so we've got messaging planned both during and outside elections. Uh, we've got a communications calendar that we develop uh, ahead of time to plan communications like this. This one was for election day, but it was planned months before, uh, and we've got messaging scheduled for each day during an election. And outside of election, it's a bit quieter, but it's something that we're developing. Uh, and our, our first two speakers were talking about process and uh, electoral management bodies talking about process. And that's something that we're trying to do even more outside of elections, because uh, there is, we're seeing a lot of interest even outside of elections, certainly something that we witnessed uh, after the 2019 election. People had questions about elections even when there is no federal election happening. Uh, this is another uh, example of how we use uh, Twitter. So we uh, developed Twitter moments uh, to really harness the, the potential uh, platform, uh, but we also have regular proactive posts on Twitter and that is one of the things that we're trying to develop is harness the potential of each and every platform that we use previously. And it's important to know that uh, electoral management bodies uh, arguably are pretty new to social media and becoming more sophisticated over time. 2015 was our first election uh, using social media. So it's still in its relative infancy for us. It used to be that you would develop a message in French and English and you would post it on all platforms without worrying about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of, of that particular platform. So we're moving more and more away from that. And in the uh, with Twitter, for example, we also pushed it a little bit during the election where uh, there was a certain service that we weren't able to offer for this election on uh, various uh, uh, campuses across the country. Uh, and a lot of people, particularly younger people, were upset about this. And one way that my team during the election uh, suggested we respond was to uh, invite people to DM us, our team, and we would walk them through ways to register and vote directly on the spot. So offering one-on-one -on -one service. Uh, and I'm not going to say that uh, it was uh, a fantastic success because our numbers were relatively limited, but the uh, elector experience of the people who did that uh, was, uh, was quite something. We got very nice notes by social media standards of people thanking us for, for doing that, and that's something that we want to continue to uh, explore in the future. I uh, thought this might be interesting for people, uh, a couple of data points. So. Outside of an election, we're a relatively small team uh, of five uh, core members. During elections, we increased that size in the 2019 election. That's the GE43 that you see. We were 28 for this past election, 31 people. Uh, but it, there's been a, a, a quite an increase in our volumes. We went from just under 45,000 inquiries uh, or messages received to 140,000. Uh, we answered more than double the number of inquiries that we did last time. And we also increased our, the number of proactive posts. Um, and that's one thing that we learn is that the, the audience is there and their expectations of how we will not just uh, act on social media, but how we will interact with them uh, has changed tremendously in, in a short period between 2019 and, and 2021. And if we had to deliver an election now, just two months later, uh, there would be even more changes. So that's how quickly things are moving. And I'll give credit to my team. That's one of the things that they're really good at is pushing to say, we, we still don't know the best way to do this. We need to continue to learn to adapt and pay attention to what's happening uh, elsewhere. Where? Uh, it, our first two presenters talked about inaccurate information, and I think I have to uh, address it as well. So after the 2019 election, our chief electoral officer said, uh, I need various teams to work more closely together. And we created something called the Environmental Monitoring Center, uh, which is 
my team, uh, and it brings together media relations, strategic communications, social media, and monitoring of the environment because the, our CEO said all these things need to work together uh, if we want to be able to tackle the information environment that we are dealing with. So what the center does, yes, we post on social media, yes, uh, we manage uh, uh, media relations, but we also observe what's in the overall environment, not just what people are tagging us on or uh, the questions that they're asking us, but what are people on social media talking about when it comes to elections? Uh, and we've observed in this recent election and even before a number of inaccurate narratives related to mail-in ballots, uh, the vote counting process, mask requirements when, uh, when electors uh, would show up to vote, and uh, vaccine passports uh, requirements, which is uh, uh, as a result of observing the environment, we developed a number of pro active posts, and you're seeing an example right here. Uh, and I'll mention that the, the vocabulary and the narratives that uh, we have been observing for the past couple of years, heavily influenced by uh, the discussion in the United States, we know that both the media and social media environments are uh, closely intertwined. Um, I always get the question from my senior management, well, are people asking us questions or posting, are they Canadian or American? And I have to say it, it, it doesn't really matter because uh, they're functioning in the same information environment. Uh, so one thing that th the creation of the center has done is uh, it's made collaboration central to everything we do so that we know what's happening in the environment, what are people saying, what their questions might be. That feeds the strategic communications component that uh, starts developing messages with uh, our internal clients and various parts of the agency, and then we can develop messaging, both proactive, I mentioned the vaccine passport example, where we were able to say, even people started asking us questions that, oh, you will not need um, a vaccine passport to, to vote in the federal election, uh, but also to get very quick uh, reactive responses. One thing that we have done in the lead up to our most recent election is developed uh, what we call a repository of answers. So we have hundreds and hundreds of potential questions and answers already approved that our agents, even people who have just been onboarded, uh, can start using right away, but they can also, when we don't have an answer, can start escalating to, to their supervisors uh, really, really quickly. And that meant that we were able to be uh, quite nimble in, uh, in the last federal election. Uh, and so we learn a couple of things, um, and that's what I wanted to end on. And I, I think I mentioned a, a couple already, but our, the expectations uh, from an audience perspective are changing, and they're changing quickly. They expect us to be where they are when they ask us a question on social media, which in the past would have gone to our public inquiries unit and, and telephone. If we encourage social media users to call us, uh, we might as well say, don't talk to us, because they will not do that. They expect us to answer where they are. Um, understanding the overall environment and spending time in between electoral events, understanding the environment uh, was uh, a game changer in terms of our messaging and being able to communicate. And we ended up, uh, even the way our, our monitoring function is, is structured, uh, to understand the relationship between uh, various groups, uh, the inaccurate information being shared about the pandemic, uh, some of the same users were sharing information about, uh, about elections. We were able to identify that already and try to come up with messaging that, uh, that if not uh, to be able to counter that uh, inaccurate information, to be able to reach that passive audience that sees that kind of inaccurate information. Uh, less is more. Uh, we were developing a lot of messages in the past. And what we've learned is uh, we can really spend more time developing more effective posts, fewer of them, and tailor them to the various platforms. Uh, and we had uh, tremendous success, particularly on Instagram, which is uh, a platform that our CEO was keen to be on because of the demographic of that platform. Uh, so we want to continue to, to build on that. Uh, and the growing number of platforms, uh, what happened after uh, the US election is we saw that the, the 
relative growth of a number of smaller platforms. So from a monitoring perspective, we tried to keep an eye on that. We were monitoring 67 platforms in 14 languages. Um, that takes time and effort to do that. Uh, but even in terms of being present on various social media platforms, we wanted to have a presence on Reddit and we discussed having a presence on TikTok. Uh, but again, that takes time. So now we're, we're trying trying to find a way to evolve from what have become the, the mainstream social platforms, the, the Twitters, Facebooks, and Instagram of the world. And uh, should we, can we be present on smaller platforms? Uh, and how do we give ourselves flexibility for the future? Because TikTok, for example, wasn't even on the radar in 2019. And then all of a sudden in 2021, um, they had a, a voter information center for the, for the Canadian election that they asked us to, to develop with them, uh, but that's not something that was in our planning. So how do we plan for the ongoing evolution of the uh, of the social media world and give ourselves a bit of flexibility? That I'm not going to pretend I have the answer today, but that's certainly something that we are discussing uh, right now. And uh, that concludes my part of it. Sorry again for the snafu at the beginning, but I'll be more than happy to take your questions. <laughs>